Hi, this is Paul. I have had a chance to take a first look at the Jordan Peterson, Alex O'Connor, Richard Dawkins video, and yeah, there's a lot to say about the video. On, on Twitter, I posted um, Strawn. Some of you might remember him from Bridges of Meaning and early days in the community. He had this great little uh, screen capture from Twitter. Um, Alex O'Connor writing, I never felt more like the corpus callosum, which is the part separating the right and left hemispheres of the brain. And uh, Evan Taylor Fishing, 76033, had another great comment. Uh, Peterson, well, this interview really kills two birds with one stone. Dawkins, that's ridiculous. We aren't killing any birds. We are sitting here talking. And that hits a lot of what that conversation was like. I, I didn't know. So, so one of my first thoughts with respect to the conversation was the fact that if you're going to have a difficult conversation, you're going to need to have a relationship that bridges the distance because otherwise people are, Richard Dawkins in this case, way too uh, defensive with respect to his ideas, his status, and his reputation. And, you know, there, there are many parts of the conversation where he's just simply being obstinate and pedantic. Whereas I think if with a little better conversation, with a little better relationship, maybe they could have gotten farther. farther. Now, Peterson um, is in many ways just sort of pleading trying to trying to get through, trying to get through. There are many parts of the conversation when Dawkins and O'Connor just sort of gang up to play the fundamentalist modernist game. And Peterson needs to figure out how he's going to answer those kinds of questions quickly to get them off the table. Now, I think it's not I, Alex O'Connor clearly understands Peterson with respect to his answer about the questions about um, historical, physical relationships and just continues to sort of want, do you, and, and Dawkins just continually peppers, do you believe in the resurrection? Do you believe in the virgin birth? And there are ways to deal with those questions quickly and effectively, and Peterson just hasn't figured out how to do that yet. But that has nothing to do with the truth value, and what I care about is the truth value. I see no, no truth value in the claims of Christianity, the virgin birth, the resurrection, the miracles. Do you believe in any of those? Do you believe Jesus was born a virgin? As I said before, there are elements of the text that I don't feel qualified to comment on. My experience has been that the more, I, like I know from a metaphorical perspective and from a mythic perspective what the story of the virgin birth means, and I accept that. I know, for example, that any culture that doesn't hold the image of the woman and infant sacred dies. Do you mean and that, I don't know how that needs to be expressed in a form. True, that, though? Do you mean that you don't know? Well, let, let me let me ask you about that because truth. This is something I talked with Sam Harris about too. Truth, as we know, is a tricky business. Do you think there are differences in the truth claims between different writers of fiction? Like is Dostoevsky uh, more profound than? No, no, well, I wouldn't call fiction truth claims anyway. I mean, well, he's a. Then on what grounds do we rank order the the fiction in terms of quality? Like Dostoevsky is a profound purveyor of fiction on the philosophical front, unbelievably deep and profound. Yes, There's something true about what he's writing about. It, it's, it's nothing to do with the truth, the truth that science is concerned with. The, tr the truth of science is the truth that gets us to the moon. I mean, th this is nothing to do with um, whether one writer of fiction has a sort of insight into human nature. That, that goes without saying, I accept that. Okay, so how do we deal with the notion that on the, fa on the purely factual side, how do we deal with the idea, let's take the, no you, you talked about clitoridectomy, let's talk about the oppression of women. Yes. We make a scientific case that that's inappropriate? Or is it a case that we're making on some other grounds? Like I see in the Judeo-Christian tradition, one of the earliest pronouncements is that both men and women carry the image of God, both. 
And that sets a certain tone to everything that follows. And it is a remarkable proclamation given its radical age that both men and women are carry the carry the image of God and are to be treated as something with intrinsic value outside of the domain of power and politics. And it isn't obvious me, it isn't obvious to me, having thought about this a lot, how we deal with that in the pure realm of fact. Because one of the facts is, if I can oppress you, why the hell shouldn't I? Yeah, my job is to keep things on track here. I think there are a number of yeah. questions which Professor Dawkins has asked quite directly yeah. that we still haven't really heard an answer to. Okay, okay. And Professor Dawkins asking about the virgin birth. You started talking about metaphor, you started talking about myth. I think anybody listening to this conversation will understand that maybe a society that doesn't believe in the virgin birth won't work. Maybe that's the predictive power that you're talking about. But I, th I think you must understand that when Professor Dawkins is asking you, do you believe that Jesus was born of a virgin? He means something like a biological fact. And, and by the way, saying I don't know, or saying you know I'm not qualified to comment, is an answer to that question, but is that your answer that you that you don't know? I said earlier, and and I I would hold to this is that there are elements of the text that I don't know how to that I'm incapable of fully accounting for. I can't account for for what the what the fundamental reality and significance of the notion of the resurrection is. My my knowledge just ends. Sure, but I, I know that whatever happened. Whatever happened as a consequence of the origination and the promotion of the Christian story was powerful enough to bring Rome to its knees and demolish the pagan enterprise. Mm. So there's some power in that story that's remarkable. Christians, Let's stick to the virgin birth. Yes. Yeah? And, and, well, the, the virgin birth results from a mistranslation of Isaiah. You know that. Um, I'm, it, like these sorts of questions, <laughs> it's, what would you say? They don't, they don't strike me as they're not getting to the point. I know that. I know has a think purpose. That. Yes. Well, I, yeah. and look, I understand that there's there's perfect reasons to debate this. I I know that, and I know that your question is more than valid. But it's beside the issue, as far as I'm concerned, and and it's it's partly because, well, when we started this conversation, I said, for example, that it it appears to be the case that a description of the structure through which we see the world is a story. We see the world through a story. And so that's a remarkable thing. That's a remarkable discovery, and it's emerged probably in the last 16 year, 60 years in multiple disciplines, because we have to prioritize our facts. And so we prioritize them according to a particular pattern. And there are patterns that seem to work and to propagate themselves properly and to orient cultures towards life abundant. And there are other patterns, the pattern of Cain, for example, that lead to absolute bloody devastation. And I don't know exactly how to construe that sort of truth, but we talked about the oppression of women, for example. It's like, how do you make a case on purely factual grounds that women should be treated as equals? It's a moral question. and I know, and, that's exa and, exactly. And I, I was dealing with a factual question, which is, did Jesus have a father? And, and you won't answer it. Well, it's, Jesus it's a different had an kind of question. father and a heavenly father, like almost all mythological heroes. So that's he wasn't born of a virgin then? He, mm -hmm. so, you, so you're saying that Jesus was not born of a virgin? I... Because of course, Peterson's main, if I get home and, you know, maybe I'll have enough time to do a proper commentary on that video. I'm not really set up and I don't have the time to do it. My mother just went to bed and I don't want to be up all night making videos. I fly home tomorrow. But there are ways of engaging that because part of the point that Peterson wants to continue to make is to force Dawkins to face the fact that a fact is a metaphorical approach to knowledge and information. And that is the main point that Peterson and the cognitive scientists are making, that even in the way that Dawkins is peppering Peterson with respect to miracles, the virgin birth, the resurrection, um, the you know, the the naming of Cain and Abel, all of this. Again, Peterson has a good answer for what Peter how Peterson thinks of it in terms of metaphor and archetype and all of these points. But Peterson needs a quick way of sort of blunting that attack and pivoting the conversation towards the points that Peterson wants to make. 
instead of sort of so much of that conversation was just hung up on those points. And those points are so, are so, you have to figure out why people care about the modern sense of historicity with respect to those questions. Deal with that head on and move on. Because the truth is, those questions don't those questions don't matter the way everyone likes to act like they think they matter. And so get on with get on with the rest of the conversation without dealing, whether you say yes, whether you say no, whether you say I don't know. Figure out exactly the relationship of historicity with respect to the text, whatever your position is, and get to the points that are actually relevant to the conversation, because otherwise you just play this silly game, which is really a political game about how can we frame Peterson? Can we frame him as an insufficient Christian who doesn't take the Bible seriously? Or can we frame him as a rube of a Christian who does not buy into the vast modern skeptical consensus? That's the game that those questions play. And you need to deal with that. You need to deal with those questions head on, blunt it, and move on with what you really want to deal with. Now, um, um, not quite sure how I want to approach all of these. Well, okay. Well, let me at least talk now about the role of sacrifice. Um, I had Peterson in the video that I made from right here last night, where I was talking about Eliada, the advent of the sacred, anticipating my conversation with Jonathan Peugeot and John Verveke, Peterson talks a lot about sacrifice in the main video on YouTube. He talks some about it in the, again, in the Exclu the Daily Wire Plus exclusive video. The Daily Wire Plus exclusive video had a nice section where Peterson, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but let's talk about sacrifice. So I did the concept of sacrifice in the biblical text because it seems so anachronistic and so primitive, you know, and primitive and not understandable. What are these people doing offering, you no know, choice cuts of meat to a god that lives in the sky. Something it's, disgusting it's, about it. Well, it's, it's, very, it's very easy to satirize. But when you start to understand that perception itself is sacrificial in its nature, and you start to understand that there's no difference between work and sacrifice, that they're the same thing, and you understand that community is predicated on sacrifice, then the emphasis in the text on sacrifice starts to become something quite marked and remarkable, especially because it's implicit. It isn't obvious at all that the authors of the texts and the editors who sequenced them actually understood what it was that they were highlighting. So with regards to the community, why is the community predicated on sacrifice? Because it's not about you, the community. Every step you take towards the communitarian means that you sacrifice something that's local to what you want here and now, right now. I think you have to give something up. You're, you're, you're wandering onto something else now, which is, which is something quite, quite different. Um, the notion of sacrifice, as you say, it, it goes right through the Old Testament and the, and the New Testament. The sacrifice of Isaac or Ishmael by Abraham and, and the sacrifice of Jesus um, is the same idea. Uh, I think it's a very unpleasant idea, by the way. Um, but what are you actually saying, are you saying that uh, Abraham did or did not sacrifice Isaac? Are you saying that Jesus really was, Jesus really did die for our sins? I mean, do you believe that? There are... did a little bit of work with this. Um, did a little bit of work with um, Notebook LM, some summaries. I'll read some of this and then do my own commentary on it. Jordan Peterson views sacrifice as a vital force driving the maturation of the individual. He posits that it's not merely an act of giving something up, but a profound process that facilitates psychological and moral development. Now, and I think this is actually a really important piece 
that I want to bring into the Peugeot Verveke conversation because I think Jordan's insight here is tremendously important. And this actually gives insight and light to the idea of the sacred coming back. Because remember, sacred is sacral. It has everything to do with sacrifice. Sacred is a word that comes from the word sacrifice. And sacrifice, well, Peterson nicely connects it with not only the maturation of an individual, but the maturation of a culture. You see, sacrifice is deeply intertwined with the development of the cortex, the center of the higher order thinking and self-regulation of the brain. This connection suggests a biological basis for human capacity for sacrifice and a role for our own personal evolution. Here's how Peterson links sacrifice to individual maturation, delayed gratification. As individuals mature, they develop the ability to delay immediate gratification for the sake of long-term goals. This capacity for delayed gratification, which is a key element of sacrifice, is associated with the development of the prefrontal cortex, enabling individuals to regulate their impulses, plan for the future, and consider the consequences of their actions. You can see this civilizationally, too. You look at, I don't want to get into politics, but the inability of national leaders to, um, to deal responsibly with issues like debt. Uh, the federal government just piling up debt, you know, both political parties doing it. Um, th this could be seen in terms of a question of sacrifice. Shifting from self-centeredness to an ethos of care. Peterson argues that sacrificing immediate desires for the sake of something larger, like a future goal or the well-being of others, marks a shift from self-centered perspective to a broader ethos of care. This expansion of concern beyond the immediate self signifies a crucial step in moral development, allowing for the formation of deeper relationships in the pursuit of higher purposes, embracing voluntary challenge. By choosing to confront difficult situations and overcome challenges, individuals engage in a form of sacrifice that strengthens their character. This voluntary confrontation with hardship, akin with exposure therapy used in psychotherapy, allows individuals to test their limits, develop resilience, and gain a deeper understanding of their capacity dying to the old self, connecting to a higher order. And, and I think this is, that, that's, a, that's a nice key nexus that Dawkins and Alex O'Connor should clearly be able to understand if they want to get beyond the modernist fundamentalist fight. wasn't what I'm looking for. All right, those are basically the same points. Now a little bit of a comment on the Daily Wire exclusive video that I know a bunch of people, tons of people ask me questions for. And I'll, I'll just mention the first part of what they got into in that half hour, which is... Richard Dawkins has a nice argument about the each animal being a microcosm of the environment. And that's, I think, a, a very important and profound insight. Peterson takes that and connects it to personality, which is super interesting. Because he makes the, he makes the point that personality and narrative are such powerful tools that we have for modeling and engaging our environment, which leads Peterson to, which, which suggests to Peterson that there must be something much more fundamental built into our environment that our use of narrative and personality reflects. The sources explore the idea of the individual, particularly the human individual, as a microcosm reflecting aspects of the larger order of reality. This concept is intertwined with discussions of personality development and its connection with a higher order, be it a cosmic order, a moral order, or the logos, the underlying principle of reasoning and meaning. 
The human brain is the most sophisticated known modeling mechanism. This complex allows for the development of personality, which can be seen as, higher um, as a highly integrated expression of... Uh, you got to really watch these language models. They're, they're pretty good for notes, but they, they don't always get this stuff right. Personality is not simply a product of social interaction, but is shaped by the demands of the environment as a whole. The shaping occur, occurs through the necessity of adapting to the challenges of survival, including finding food, av avoiding predators, negotiating the complexities of social life. There, there's a very interesting part in the main YouTube conversation where they got into Dragon. And again, it just so often felt like Richard Dawkins was being pedantic because, okay, what do you mean by predator? Predator is somehow a word that's acceptable, but dragon is a word that's unacceptable, even though Dawkins is a smart man. He should understand what Peterson is doing. The violation of the story of Adam and Eve is interpreted as a narrative for human relationship to this higher order. The, vid the forbidden fruit symbolizes the temptation to overstep the boundaries of this order, to assume we can control and manipulate it to our own purposes. The violation of this order leads to a state of chaos and suffering symbolized by hell, casting out of the garden. The sources suggest that the human capacity for personality, with its potential for both good and evil, reflects the higher order in a unique way. Um, the moral dimension of personality is reflected to the archetypal patterns of mythology, which depict the struggle between order and chaos. So often, Peter Dawkins will say things like, well, I like facts and you like mythology. And, and what's so amazing is that Again and again in the video, Richard Dawkins, who keeps wanting to go back to fact, simply expresses the reality by virtue of personal preference. You like this, I like that. You like this, I like that. And it's like, okay, well, what happens to your facts? And I think I, I think Peterson, you know, this clearly, Dawkins is someone that Peterson doesn't have a lot of access to. So Peterson wanted to get the most bang for the buck in this video. But there simply wasn't as much time to do it. And Jonathan Peugeot had a, had a really clever, um, um, had a really clever retort on, on Twitter with respect to the thing. If only Dawkins would take a few more sips of his own meme theory, we could have a conversation. But until then, I'll let Jordan Peterson continue to hack away at an iron statue with feet of clay. Um, you know, it's, yeah. And, and as with the, the Sam Harris conversations a number of years ago, People are going to interpret this according to the mooks and the knights. The mooks will cheer their knight and on and on. But, and, and of course, you can easily frame this video in that light as well. But there is so little reflection on the word fact in terms of, okay, what does this mean? How does what we now know about attention and value impact what we see as facts, how we arrange facts, the narratives we construct with facts? Because the truth is, science does nothing. People do things. And almost every person that is out there wanting to say fact, 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 has to try to employ these facts in narratives. It's spent, it's spent. So maybe that's enough for now. I can't make these terribly long because I did, my mother has, my mother is not set up to be a YouTuber. My mother has an internet connection that is meant so that she can uh, use the internet. Use the internet the way my mother wants to use the internet. Um, my sister has has a fiber connection. I have a fiber connection. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. So I don't think my voice has fully recovered. 
maybe it's just been I just do much so much visiting and talking with family over these last few days that um, I'm rather hoarse tomorrow I'll spend most of the time on the plane I'll work on sermons I'll get some video ideas I'll try and get some other things done in preparation for getting home and um, yeah maybe if I have some time in I don't have a lot of time in uh, airports tomorrow maybe I'll make a, a membership video or two we'll see so Anyway, first thoughts on the Peterson, the latest Peterson, Richard Dawkins conversation. So leave a comment.